Okay, great. So we are live and we've got seven viewers. Hello, everybody. Welcome to part six of our discussion of the German Revolution by Pierre Bruet. Uh, we uh, studied chapters, uh, let's see, we did 15 through 18 last time. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about chapters 19 through 22, which is all about uh, the Communist Party and kind of the contradictions of ultra leftism and uh, all kinds of uh, other um, chaos and stuff uh, hitting the fa shit hitting the fan during the course of the year, mostly during 1920. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I want to uh, give my co-hosts a chance to introduce themselves. So let's do real quick, uh, go around, do names, pronouns, and uh, if you have a YouTube channel, go ahead and plug it. If you, uh, and uh, maybe just give like a quick, like one sentence description of why you think it's important for the contemporary left to study the German revolution. Um, and uh, any of you can start, go ahead. Oh, hold on, let me just switch over to my sh screen share. Just a sec. There we go. Okay. On camera today. Oh yeah, look at that. Well, anyway, we should be good. But right, go ahead, guys. Oh, Simba's here now. So let me uh, see if I can add them to the call. I know this goes. Okay. <laughs> so Alki is my special guest today. So Alki, could you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself first? Okay, sure. Um, hi, I'm Alki Historiker, or you can just call me Alki for short. I do labor history on YouTube. I'm doing a series where we're looking at American labor history, more or less from the American Revolution to the present day. Um, currently, I, I have a video scheduled actually to come out tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about the Shoemaker Strike of 1860. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's basically, uh, everything about me. Video. I'm excited. Okay. And since I'm talking, I guess I volunteered myself to go. <laughs> um, well, one second. I am Kyle. Uh, everyone can call me that. Uh, my, I'm labor Kyle on everything. I, uh, make stuff on the internet. Uh, mostly on YouTube. I also Twitch stream a few days a week. Um, I make videos about Marxism and video games, basically. And speaking of new videos, I should have an I should have one coming out in the next like three or four days. Uh, I would say maybe a little. It's usually longer than that, but I'm definitely home a lot right now. So uh, and it's going to be on um, Antonio Negri uh, Empire, uh, the book uh, that he and Michael Hart wrote. And uh, the game Outlast 2. Um, and it's going to be basically... I'm, I'm big into horror. And I haven't revealed that on my YouTube channel. But everyone's about to find out. Because uh, <laughs> it's going to be cool. Um, but anyways. Um, you, uh, my pronouns are he, him. And you can, uh, I think the significance of the German Revolution um, is... Uh, to put it very simply, demonstrated by the amount of people that we have here talking about the level of importance that they understand this event has, as well as the lack of knowledge that they've been given in all other sort of aspects of either their formal education or otherwise, um, their self-education or whatever. Um, because in general, it's, a, it's an event that's pushed from our memory, popular memory and that sort of a thing. Um, and I think just considering that, that shows at least the level of importance that I think it has. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, that 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 is very good. Um, I am I am Izzy. My pronouns are she they. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, Izzy does everything, where I do everything, and also talk about like revolutionary stuff sometimes. Um, uh, I am a, a disaster, and um, I have lost my nose. That is okay. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the importance of uh, the German Revolution, uh, uh, at least uh, 
it to us is uh, understanding it uh, from just like a, 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 a materialist point of view and seeing how like just about every other event that occurred in it was pretty much a worst case scenario. Um, and um, uh, uh, trying our best to uh, 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 maybe try to learn from that. Right on. Uh, um, I'm yeah. trying to get Simba connected, uh, and they'll uh, join us uh, as soon as they can. Uh, but uh, I guess in the meantime, I will just introduce myself. I'm Melody, uh, she, her pronouns. Uh, my channel is called A World to Win, This the channel you're watching this on. Uh, and I make um, educational YouTube videos from a Marxist-Leninist perspective. Um, big fan of kind of uh, labor history. Uh, big uh, into guys like uh, Harry Braverman and Kim Moody. That's kind of my big intellectual influences. Um, and uh, my background is actually not in the humanities, but in the natural sciences. I have a, an education in... Uh, uh, physics, but um, I think that studying the German Revolution is really pertinent to uh, the political moment right now, especially in the United States, and I guess also in the other parts of the Imperial Corps, including modern Germany, where the uh, far right is ascendant, and uh, socialist politics are kind of starting to gain traction, but we've been... Uh, the, the socialist left, particularly in the United States, has kind of been grounded to the dust for the last 40 years, and we're kind of building it from scratch again. So, um, you know, I think that the German Revolution has a lot of lot to teach us about the pitfalls of um, what can go wrong in a leftist movement. So I'm going to try to add Simba to the call again. I just uh, tried calling him right now. They, uh, this uh, still says that they're un unavailable. I know, it's so silly. Um, well, we're gonna try to keep trying to bring them in, so, uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, the way that, so for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, the way that we run these streams is we spend about the first hour or so, give or take, depending on how long the section we read is. Uh, we take about the first hour to just summarize the chapters that we read, and then we spend the remaining time uh, discussing kind of questions that came up for us during the reading, um, you know, how we think that things are pertinent to the current moment in um, leftist uh, history and history in general, and that sort of thing. And then uh, just, uh, you know, Make sure for you at home watching that this is uh, this is a very much a participatory sport. We want you guys asking questions and making comments yourself um, in the chat. Um, things that you're curious about, please make them known. Because if you're if you have a question, chances are somebody else has a question too, and that includes us. We are not a panel of experts hand uh, handing out information. We are. Um, you know, just ordinary people reading a, a very difficult book from a very, um, you know, difficult part of history to, oh, Simba, can you mute? Actually, getting some. I think Simba, I think we got them. I think there are two, I think Simba had the same problem I did last week, which is two different Skype usernames, because I think it just oh. said they joined. Yeah, Simba, can you hear us? You're muted, Simba. Uh oh, I hate this. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Oh dear. Um, is this the first time it's ever happened on Left Tube? Uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um. Well, you know. So uh, we don't uh, need to spend any more time, kind of uh, horsing around. So uh, Kyle is covering chapter uh, nineteen today. So I'm gonna go ahead and um mute myself so that we can get going with these summaries. Kyle, are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. This, All right. Uh, Let's get the show on the road then. So uh, 
I have the uh, I, I got two pleasures this week. Uh, one, I got the first chapter again. Simba's here. Oh, I hey, see Simba. we just did introductions. Simba, do you oh, want to uh, go ahead? Why, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, name, pronouns, and uh, your YouTube channel if you'd like, and uh, why you think it's important for the modern left to study the German Revolution. All right, cool. So first off, do you guys hear my dogs fighting outside, or or is that cool? I can't hear. Him. Can't hear them. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I'm Simba. They them. Um, channel is Young Simba, though I'm most active on Twitter. Um, yeah. So I think that the uh, German Revolution is particularly important because all really uh, all revolutions are important, and uh, as one of the guests uh, last last time mentioned, um, this isn't just the failure of a communist revolution, but a failure of you know a liberal democracy and ultimately a fascist takeover um and it's a very economically forward situation but politically backward uh so that that's very relevant to what we're dealing with right now and there was a lot of right opportunism as well um what was the other thing i was supposed to mention that was it okay awesome. you did it yeah so welcome, <laughs> i did it welcome yeah, simba and now we've got uh everyone is here so let's go ahead okay. and get our um Summaries underway. So, Kyle, if you're ready, I will hand things over to you. Yeah, I'm definitely ready. Um, I'm going to do something that I've gotten a lot better at since doing stuff uh, online, which is I'm going to adjust the settings for my web camera. As you can hear me, uh, essentially, um, uh, stall. Um, so, basically, uh, just to get everyone sort of caught up, there uh, we're sort we're at the point in the German Revolution to where uh, there's already been sort of significant movement in several different ways, as well as a lot of what you could very easily call counter-revolutionary activity. Um, in particular, uh, one event that is probably one of the more well-known events in the context of this uh, uh, revolution, the Cop Push, um, which was... Uh, so essentially where we are right now is after this and where, where chapter 19 jumps off. Um, Hold on. Do you want to maybe is, just uh, in the fourth KPD Congress, which occurred uh, that very next April between the 14th and the 15th. Kyle, and, sorry, can I uh, interrupt you? Yes. Yeah. Hit sorry. Me, hit me. Why don't you uh, just give like a, a five second or a one sentence recap of what the cop push was for the folks who are just joining us for the first time. Good call. Um, so, Basically, uh, there were, um, se uh, after the declaration of a republic in Germany, there were, na there were uh, groups of uh, na nationalist oppositional elements to this um, who, attempt who attempted and successfully to uh, drive the government outside of Berlin. Um, and so the government then reformed uh, outside of Berlin and then uh, put down this particular government takeover by nationalists uh, by calling for and instituting a general strike. Is that good? Is that is that a good summary? Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Um, sorry, I am. I I, I thought I was going to be cool showing my webcam settings, and now it's. Uh, I'm just really blue, so I'm going to just say fuck that. Okay. So, and now where we are is after all of this has sort of come crashing down on top of the already very sort of fractured and, uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, all the, all the, the messy bitches that are in uh, the German left that I love, but that old buddy, um, they're really coming swinging at each other in particular for uh, the KPD's reaction to this call for a general strike. Um, a lot of hesitancy and then some uh, just outright opposition um, uh, because they were hesitant uh, about the timetable that this, you know, event was sort of pushing revolutionary moment. It was becoming, very, it was becoming much more pressing and pressing as uh, time moved on. And uh, according to Bruet, as well as I, uh, many other people there, they were not 
judging very well uh, what exactly was happening in front of them as it was happening. And as we can see, has been a theme sort of through the stream so far. Uh, by the time they were figuring out what was going on, things were already moving and was kind of fumbling out of their hands. And so <clears throat> this conference of the KPD, which is, occurs as uh, in the last stream, in the, in the very last part of the last chapter, um, there was a split uh, in the KPD between what uh, Bure was describing as the ultra leftist elements of the Communist Party of Germany. And uh, in this case, we're talking uh, about individuals who had or who were more inclined toward uh, what we would call syndicalism uh, as well as trade unionism. And by that, I mean uh, uh, models of socialism and left wing thought, political thought that focus more on the role of trade unions and uh, the role of workers themselves in revolution rather than uh, the role of a revolutionary vanguard party. Um, and so there was already some, there was already a lot of tension there. And then uh, as a result, uh, these, uh, as they call them, ultra leftist oppositional elements split um, into essentially a secondary KPD party. Um, and now there's this conference that's going on to where everyone is basically discussing what the fuck just happened. And everyone seems to be pretty mad which is understandable <laughs> because it did not go very well. Um, and in general, what Brue is sort of putting into focus for us is these events and then these individual players, in particular, the uh, existing elements of leadership that were left over um, from the previous few iterations of the German left. As, we, as we've seen in the previous few streams, there's been an evolution in the parties splits the communist party of germany did not exist when this book started and now it's been around at least for a little bit and so um <clears throat> excuse me these sort of further divides uh were tensions that i think what brewer showed really well they were tensions that had were born before this conflict happened um and they continue to manifest themselves they continue to sort of come up again like in the context of this event and will further on, suggesting that there's you know more going on as, as we've seen, and we'll talk about that. But what's important here is a break for one second to wet the whistle, and there we go. Um, first thing to start with my summary is what I think is the most important takeaway um, from this chapter. Um, and what I think is most interesting, it's also a short chapter, so I've got you know just a little bit more left, really. Um, the the most important takeaway to me is that the central committee, uh, not just the idea that these decisions of the central committee did, you know, either not fully support to essentially make costly decisions with regard to this general strike, you know, weren't very good. I think most people agreed with that, even people who were having difficulty or who were on the committee. Um, but it, that they weren't even these debates weren't just occurring within the context of the party, um, but in the international as well, and it got debated fairly heavily. Um, uh, at the international stage as well. And I think that's that's the most important takeaway because this is a very uh, sort of high-risk, high-reward situation that they found themselves in, which none of us know what that's like oh, right now. Kyle, and could you, at, real quick, could you explain what the third international is? Uh, would someone else like to, so I'm not okay. just talking the entire time? Yeah, no worries. I'm sorry. I'll, uh, I, feel like I actually I'm included a little bit about it for my section, but this seems like an opportune time to uh, explain it. So yes. let me go ahead and read that because uh, it's part of my script, and I'm actually probably going to read it again because it's just a good thing to reinforce. So uh, the Second Communist International collapsed in 1914. So the international... The first international was Marx and Bakunin and the, the old layer of communists back in 1872 is called the International Workingmen's Association. Uh, and so the second one was its successor, and it included uh, the parties like the German Social Democratic Party uh, and the Social Democratic Parties all over Europe and so on. So the Second Communist International had collapsed in 1914 after the corrupted socialist parties across Europe had sided with their respective ruling bourgeois classes in supporting the call to arms of World War I, a heinous betrayal of fundamental socialist principles. Um, the socialist parties had effectively been incorporated into the bourgeois state machinery and neutralized, turned into powerful organs of control which served 
more to pacify the masses of working people than to, rather than to fight for their genuine interests. The Marxist intellectuals, who are the ideological center for this backslide into placid co cooperation, claimed that Marx had underestimated capitalism's ability to self-stabilize and that the working class movement's ability to win reforms from the bourgeoisie through the socialist parties was adequate to smooth over the rough edges. A socialist transition could be achieved through gradually introducing reforms to the system. These intellectuals, such as the German uh, social democrat Edward Bernstein, uh, revised Marx's theory, claiming that in light of all of this, revolution was no longer necessary. They thus styled themselves as revisionists, despite the pejorative connotation that that word has now. At this time, it was a self-selected word. It is worth noting that revisionist has a lot of very different connotations now that are not really germane to this, but when we've heard of re revisionism on our streams here, this is what we're talking about. Um, thus, it was necessary after the end of World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution to constitute a third international that was free of uh, this kind of petty bourgeois opportunism and rightward drift that the um, second international had suffered from. Um, so it would simply later be called the common turn. Uh, to consolidate the victory of the working class and peasantry in the former Russian Empire and organize the spread of uh, organize to spread the flames across the flames of revolution across the rest of Europe and God willing the rest of the world. So that's a quick little crash course in the in the history of the uh, in the communist internationals. That's very good. You should read. You should at, at least what it, like even. Even like whatever the most important part you think is, we should go over that again later because that's good. Yeah, time. well, that was help. actually that was part of my script, and I just like was like, oh, this is perfect time to introduce this concept. So couldn't resist. Boom! When you're right, you're right. I was looking for quotes actually while you were doing that. I grabbed one, and uh, I'm looking for another one right now. But um, I think I think it's a. I, I think description of the the third international or the common turn in this particular context is also really important because it helps give us a a, a broader understanding of how the German Revolution, which this this goes very sort of like deep, and you get into like sort of like the heavy grain of the event itself, and even as Brue is sort of like pulling it out and like putting it in context in particular with what's going on uh, with. Uh, doing it through correspondence with Lenin and Lenin's in this chat. Lenin's opinion is in this chapter as well, um, and sort of having an eye toward the international. Um, even within those contexts, it can still. I, I just find this interesting. Be hard to sort of, you know, place it within a larger sort of revolutionary process that was happening in the early parts of the tw uh, um, 20th century, which I think is really neat. And to that point, um, a good summary. In general, so, you know, basically where we are is that these, like, what the fuck happened um, during, like, and with regard to this general st strike that happened during the cop push uh, was a really kind of hot topic, um, at least according to Brue. And, uh, well, it, it was. He, he's right. Um, and uh, there was a lot of people discussing it. This quote summarizes sort of like a, a, the the main critique that Brue leverages throughout that. Um, it, and, uh, ah, fuck, who was this quote again? I just had it in my hands a minute ago. I think it's Bella Coon. Uh, no, 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 it's a Levy. This is Paul Levy. Um, and this is on page 382 for anyone who's following along. Uh, it, the quote says, I cannot remain calm when I think that the opportunity for, uh, for which we have been waiting for months has presented itself at last. The right has committed a colossal blunder, and instead of profiting from it, from the situation to ensure that our party has a leading role, as we did in 1918, we get this puerile absurdity. I do not see how the party can recover from such a blow. Um, and so basically, he goes on to sort of argue that um, the, the actions that took place were removed from a lot of the realities that were happening um, and sort of... It, the Communist Party sort of it, it lost an opportunity to sort of insert itself into that particular moment and to like show the masses who was on what side and to do so very, very clearly. 
Um, and I think that's actually a relatively fair critique, although we're not really getting into uh, I'm still summarizing. But uh, I and I think that's a good summation of that particular camp. And there are other critiques of what went on as well. Um, but I, I think that's the best summary is that a, a difficulty in judgment that came from the leadership, um, uh, their inability to sort of read the winds and understand what was happening while it was happening. Um, and I think uh, Bellicun had the, probably the best dig of it, which was really funny. I, uh, Bellicun being the, uh, the Crimean Revolutionary Committee, um, uh, another revolutionary in this time, uh, he's called the, uh, what was it, uh, called the belief, he called this, this, their actions, he said, was essentially saying that, you know, the best thing that we can do right now is going to be at the best bourgeois democracy. He called it a reactionary utopia, um, which was something that was interesting. And uh, also a familiar sentiment uh, in terms of the other chapters we've read, which the, the good context for if you haven't been in the other previous streams is that timing and sort of a, an imagination that can anticipate and picture when things are supposed to happen and what you do were sort of like the name of the game here. Uh, the other really only uh, key part of the chapter, um, besides there is uh, some general more specificity in the conversation around sort of some things that went wrong, um, was this the idea uh of a uh, what they call a the declaration of a loyal opposition, and I'll explain that. The uh, um, a loyal opposition is really it's usually it's a specifically a term used in parliament. So like in using in government, if you declare yourself a loyal opposition, uh, from what I understand, in most contexts, uh, but I don't think all. I think it may have some sort of uh, variation. So excuse me if I'm incorrect about uh, one part of it or some context uh because i don't know i don't know everything uh the idea of a loyal opposition is adherence to the body um or the type or the sort of form of government itself so say you have a uh a, a, a parliamentary democracy um you may oppose the person who is in charge of and running that parliamentary democracy but to be a loyal opposition would mean that that the existence of that parliamentary uh, democracy is something that's uh, you see as appealing or something that is, you know, uh, I, be it strategically, be it ideologically, be it for any number of reasons. Uh, and so there was a, a declaration by the KPD of a loyal opposition, and it was very confusing for <laughs> a, a lot of people. And the summary that I think I can get uh, from, just to sum it up real quick, because I've been going long enough, um, is that a lot of people either saw sort of confusion from the decisions that they were making in this context and the declaration of a loyal opposition, or they saw it as a, a deceptive de decision to make, uh, that it either was running deceptive to uh, how they were presenting themselves to working people in these contexts, or that it was deceiving other people in the party or other people who are supposed to be aligned to the party, and that they were having difficulty understanding their priorities and what they were going to do in any particular situation in time. <laughs> And there was a lot of, uh, uh, everyone was very mad, and they all were very yelly. And I think that is a decent summary, at the very least. We can talk details later if we have time. Heck yeah. Well, great job. Um, I'm going to uh, put a little uh, breath in our, uh, that was great. I'm going to uh, put a little breath in our uh, study group here. I'm going to take a minute to switch over to this screen so that I can make my quick little plug for uh, the show. Uh, this is... Um, hey, Izzy, can you mute real quick? Anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, I keep this show going for no money. I, I don't ask for... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, nobody pays me to do this. Uh, I do... You know, no, none of us get paid to do this. This is all a volunteer basis, uh, but it does, you know, does really help me to keep the channel going. Uh, if you subscribe to my Patreon and uh, follow me on Twitter, that uh, really helps our show a lot. And um, so that's my quick plug. And I'm probably going to show this screen at least one more time before we close out for today. So 
with that in mind, I'm going to hop back over to this screen and go ahead and start talking about chapter 20, which is called Moscow and the German Revolutionaries. Um, and I will be uh, sharing the responsibility for uh, summarizing this chapter with my guest co-host Alki here in just a minute. So without further ado, Moscow and the German Revolutionaries. The chaos of the Kap Lutwitz Putsch and the KPD's uh, inability to respond effectively exposed their level of disorganization and inexperience. In 1920, the newly born Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, soon to be the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, was struggling for its survival against the monarchist White Army and 14 imperialist armies which had co collectively dogpiled on the young socialist nations in the wake of the October Revolution of 1917. The goal was, in the words of Winston Churchill, to strangle the Bolshevik baby in its crib. Many in the Bolshevik leadership thought that their condition would be greatly relieved by the victory of proletarian revolutions across Europe most especially Germany, with its vast resources, modernized industry, and key geographical, fe key geographical features. Uh, Nikolai Bukharin, um, expressing the sentiment, wrote, quote, This shows that it is not possible for the Russian Revolution to be finally victorious without the victory of the international revolution. The victory of socialism is the only salvation for the world, its flesh mutilated and blood white. But without proletarian revolution in Europe, it is impossible for the, for the socialist proletariat in Russia to have a lasting victory. And that's on page 394 in the Brue book. It is difficult to put into words just how ruinous the RSFSR's condition was in the wake of the October Revolution and World War I and the conditions of the Civil War. Uh, doing so with any justice to uh, to the gravity of the situation would take more time than we have here. Uh, so it shall have to suffice for now to say that the Young Socialist Project was in a desperate state of siege from without and from within, with each passing day being a battle for life or death. Um, Bukharin concluded, the working class in Russia encountering is encountering a rampant a rampart, excuse me, the working class in Russia is encountering a rampart which can be broken only by the assault of the International Workers' Revolution. So then um, I'm going to repeat parts of my summary of what the common turn is, because this is where I had initially um, planned to read it. Uh, so the second common turn, the second communist international is a giant clusterfuck of careerists and opportunists and a bunch of um, people who gotten a little bit too comfortable with uh, their situation. So they all sided with their respective uh, bourgeoisies and uh, voted for war credits in World War I, massive betrayal of socialist principles, blah, blah, blah. It sucks. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg is so depressed about it, she considers blowing her brains out. Um, I'm not joking. You can look that up. That's she was like, so actually several people, several people did actually kill themselves because of that, because they were just so gobsmacked that, that the socialist movement would make such a massive betrayal. Um, so the idea behind forming a third international, a third communist international was to help consolidate the power and victory of the October revolution and, uh, if, if that all went well to spread communist revolution around the whole world. So between the Germans and the Russians, however, uh, this posed some major problems. The leading revolutionary intellectuals, uh, Lenin in Russia, Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, for example, had deep differences of, of opinion on questions of party organization and the role of the party in making revolution. Um, just as an aside, I recommend uh, John Molyneux's collection of essays uh, called Marxism and the Party, if you want kind of a, a compare and contrast on Lenin and Luxembourg. Um, 
What united the German movement with the Russian Revolution was hence not ideological and programmatic, but rather in spirit. A shared hatred for the common class enemy and the bourgeoisie, and the unquestionable need for a socialist revolution. Whatever form the latter would take, though, was still uh, on the table, was still being contested. A minority of activists within the Spartacus group, uh, for example, opposed the constitution of the Third International for various reasons. The time wasn't right, they feared an overbearing influence from Moscow, and so on and so on. However, the deaths of Luxembourg and Liebknecht in 1919, January of 1919, uh, made it very difficult for the Russians to uh, make effective political criticisms of the German movement. Perhaps more important, however, was that the writings of the Russian communists during this period revealed that they lacked accurate information on the happenings in Germany. This was not wholly uncommon at the time, as lines of communication were not readily as readily available as they are today, and some distortions were bound to come into play. This was also true during the Biennio Rosso, the two red years of factory occupations and revolutionary upsurge in Italy, uh, from 1919 to 1920, where the Italian socialists lacked credible information about the Bolshevik Revolution because of heavily, uh, very heavy censorship and other distortions of communication. Uh, and that also, just as another aside, that left the communists, in, the communists and socialists in uh, Italy, uh, profoundly confused about uh, what to do next uh, because of the just absolute clusterfuck of non-information that they had from what was going on in, in Russia. So uh, a lot, though certainly not all of the errors of analysis here can be attributed to lack of good information rather than like malice or self-interest or whatever. Um, so uh, moving on here, uh, there's a distinction in uh, Bolshevik theory and practice between parliamentarism, parliamentarianism as an end in itself and as opposed to limited, specific interventions in bourgeois institutions. Uh, Brouet writes on page 399, quote, In these conditions, the discussion about communists utilizing bourgeois parliaments was obscure only because of a confusion between parliamentarianism as the, as the expression of a political choice in favor of the parliamentary system itself and the participation of revolutionaries in elected assemblies, uh, which they would use as platforms for their politics. Taking part in elections could not be regarded as an absolute rule, but there could, no be, there could be no question of rejecting it on principle, end quote. This should, however, not be redu simply reduced to a pure and simple questions about principles and tactics. These were incredibly complex questions that even the most vocal advocates of the various tendencies struggled to articulate answers to, both in theory and in practice. As mentioned before, all of these issues were further muddied by the limited communication between the different national groups and the sometimes mistaken political analyses and courses of action that flowed from them. Uh, it is in this context uh, that in June of 1920, uh, Lenin publishes his infamous pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. Um, Bruet emphasizes that, while Lenin did not intend to make uh, sweeping transhistorical proclamations, nonetheless, quote, he regarded Bolshevism as a condensation of worldwide revolutionary experience, as much in the art of attack as it was in that of defense. Uh, hey, Alki, can you mute? Oh, I'm sorry about that. No worries. Um, he regarded Bolshevism as a condensation of worldwide revolutionary experience, as much in the art of attack as in that of defense. He did not wish, for all of that, to make the Bolshevik experience the universal model. Nonetheless, he declared, quote, Experience has proved that, on certain very important questions of the proletarian revolution, all countries will inevitably have to do what Russia has done, end quote. So left-wing communism is a pamphlet worthy of a whole discussion unto itself, and for that I would highly recommend the episode of the Red Menace podcast on it. It's really clarifying. Um, we will undoubtedly be discussing this pamphlet uh, at least kind of in passing during our discussion, 
Uh, but I will stress that it is a topic that requires a lot more attention to detail than we have time for today in our broader discussion of the events in Germany. It is a document that has been used and abused by both celebrants and detractors of Lenin and Bolshevism, so it is well worth learning about in depth. So, uh, critically, Brue stresses that the ultra-left tendencies explicitly denied the need for a revolutionary party and drew a hard line between the masses and the leaders by implying a total antagonism between the two. Uh, that's page 402. Um, Rue writes, the ultra-leftists on the, relied on the obvious observation that the trade union leaders were bound up with the bourgeoisie against the revolution and called upon revolutionaries to leave the unions and fight to destroy them. It was, however, however, it was essentially via the reformist trade unions that the reactionary leaders maintained their grip on the masses. The duty of revolutionaries, on the contrary, therefore, was to fight within the trade unions in order to challenge the reformist chiefs for leadership of the masses. Quote, to refuse to work in the reactionary trade unions means leaving the insufficiently developed or backward masses of workers under the influence of the reactionary leaders, the agents of the bourgeoisie, the labor aristocrats, or workers who have become completely bourgeois, end quote. So Lenin's basically saying, like, you can't just abandon the trade unions, you have to actually challenge the reactionary leadership, and if you want to lead the proletarian movement, you have to you have to get in there and struggle for power. So his uh, sharp characterization of the ultralefts as infantile is um, illustrative of his stereotypical polemical excess, uh, for which he is absolutely notorious for. Um, but he also clearly, in this context, we can really pick up on the fact that he means infantile in a much more literal sense as well. Um, the German communists were disproportionately themselves very young, and their movement was also young. Um, whereas, German, or whereas the Russian communists had formed their m movement in 1898 and accumulated nearly two decades of experience before seizing power, the German movement had been born over the course of no more than a few years, with the revolutionary element being an isolated minority for most of the history of the socialist parties there. Um, Lenin, in essence, wanted to prevent the German left from falling into uh, what Rosa Luxemburg herself had been concerned with while she was still alive, which was the risk of becoming an isolated band of radicals with uh, little, if any, connection to the masses of working people. And uh, that is where I have ended my summary. And I will, Alki, if you're ready, hand things over mm -hmm. to you. Um, yeah. And I'll Unless, actually, both... do, do you want to do we want to leave that to breathe for a minute, or do you want to make some comments, or? Um. Uh, how do you all feel since I'm the guest? <laughs> well, you know, the, we try to keep these things pretty conversational, casual, right? We're trying to facilitate in an environment that's, you know, uh, pretty relaxed. So, uh, you know, if we feel like just moving on and keeping the summaries going, we can do that. Um, but if you guys want to, uh, you know, break it up a little bit and leave a little breathing room between things, uh, we can do that too. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys. Al, can you give it, give one take and then, and then summarize. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that I I, I noticed as well, um, and it's this is kind of sort of before I started learning German, is uh, when I saw this like this infantile disorder as it was uh, classified, um, uh, I got one reaction from it. Um, however, years ago when I looked at the document in German and I looked at like how it's described in German, in uh, in German, uh, infantile disorder would be like uh, Kinderkrankheit, right? And I started thinking about it sort of from that term and really um, the way that like we think of it as like an infantile disorder, like he very much was thinking of it, yeah, as a a very new, a very recent thing, um, especially when you look at the fact, and I have, I want to say I have the note here, when you look at like the ages, a lot of these German communists, like for instance, most of them were 
you know, in their 20s and 30s. I think yeah. uh, I saw a figure somewhere that it was like less than, no, uh, 75% were under the age of about 35. Yeah. And uh, I saw one figure, as a matter of fact, that said that uh, when it came to people over the age of 50, there was only one person, right? Zetkin, right? Um, so, so this is, you know, a very young movement. And so when we're talking about like an infantile disorder, we're not just talking about like infantile as you know as like uh this is childish or something like it's infantile as in these people are very young this is a very young recent thing um but uh, lenin uh, Lenin having a boomer moment hey you kids get off my lawn (laughs) (laughs) you could you could almost say that (laughs) though him also sort of being like you know hey kids we we did this before back in my day you know yeah and he's making, I mean, that's like, to be fair to kind of the the Germans in their situation as well, like Lenin is making these criticisms and like, uh, Alki's going to talk about Hermann Goethe's response, which is uh, relevant, but like, you know, they're kind of calling him out being like, hey, old man, listen to what we're dealing with here. You have no <laughs> idea what's, you have no idea what's going on on the ground over here. And like, Gorter in his response is like, okay, look, I learned a lot from reading your pamphlet, and I think you're right about a lot of things. However, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, but yeah, so, but this is kind of where communication, like the breakdown of communication comes in, because, um, you know, it just trying to communicate between Germany and Russia, like we don't think of that as being very far, right? But the, I mean, during this time, when you take into account the events and the politics, uh, that is quite a distance, um, especially when you're trying to send delegates back and forth between the Soviet, uh, between Soviet Russia and Germany. Um, so anyway, the ultra left feels like they've just been called out, and effectively they have just been sort of called out. Um, and so their response, or at least the response of him and Goethe, who was a Dutch communist, he is essentially saying that Lenin is kind of out of touch, which to a degree is very true. Um, And his big critique is that um, the idea of like these, the mass of poor peasants, like that doesn't, that doesn't exist really in Germany um, in the same way that it did in the Soviet Union. And uh, one of the things that I found really interesting is he quotes um, uh, Pennekoek, sort of like talking about how the Western values of like parliamentary democracy, but also of just like bourgeois culture, like that had made an impression on like the German working class and like the working the workers of the West and Western Europe. And he argued that for these workers, right, within these trade unions, they were under the illusion that decisive battles could be won with ballots, right? And that the workers needed to be awoken from that illusion. Right, because the, the unions were a obstacle to like class consciousness and to that of um, basically the consciousness of workers and to direct action. And the idea sort of was is that like he puts forth, if I remember correctly, uh, the idea that trade unions should be replaced by workers' unions, like organized by uh, workplace rather than by trade, uh, which I found very interesting because. Um, thinking about like a union in modern day like the UAW is sort of like that where like all the workers within like an auto plant are are unionized right so you could kind of think about it sort of like that um but that's what he's calling for like a replacement of the trade unions and trying to wake up basically workers from like this illusion um and i think it's really interesting uh, and i have the quote here one sec Uh, but he 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 thinks that Eric, like Lenin is making like a huge mistake, like when he's calling upon like communists to build like mass parties because he thinks these mass parties they're gonna basically repeat the same opportunist errors of like the social democracy, and they need to concentrate more effort on educating and like creating what he calls uh, pure and firm kernels like of communists, right and. I find that really interesting because 
like looking at like unions, like I haven't actually studied that much about, about for instance, like people's history in terms of like this time period. But what like little bit I know and like what I kind of understand about it, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting critique um, comparing that to what Lenin has said. Um, and now I kind of want to move on to talk a little bit about uh, the debates about the revolution of 1919. Uh, And so we're starting to see, you know, what <laughs> what some people might see as like the stereotypical left, right? Where the left is sort of going back and forth and arguing with each other, right? And, you know, in the context of this time period, it makes a lot of sense, right? You know, you've just seen the failure of a revolution and you're trying to figure out like, why? Why did this fail? But at the same time, you're trying to figure out, okay, where are we going to go from here, right? And so I find it really interesting because in early 1920, uh, Radek, who I know we've uh, you guys have talked about before, he had been released from prison. And so he starts publishing or he uh, publishes a work sort of talking about the failure of like the Hungarian and the Bavarian uh, communists and achieving um, any successes. Right. And so for him. His opinion, it was because they had sort of a lack of a communist party, uh, like a firm communist party, but it was also because they decided to work with centrists, right? And so that was like the the Hungarian left, the social democrats. But it was also like um, in the case of Germany and Bavaria, it was like the Bavarian uh, independence. And um, he, he says a very interesting quote where he says, like, it's necessary to accept unity uh, – but it's also necessary to like erect gallows, um, and that you know one must not be satisfied just with theses, right? Um, however, uh, Bure he says like there was no correlation between, for instance, the degree of disorganization of the bourgeoisie and like the organization of the proletariat. So uh, Paul Levy uh, he says more or less that they failed. Uh, that the Hungarian communists and the Bavarian communists didn't fail for the same reason. Um, he says the Hungarian communists basically failed because they failed to really like um, create a sense of class consciousness that wasn't obscured by um, what he calls like illusions of like the unity of all socialists, right? Um, which we could get into an interesting discussion about left unity later. Um, uh, but another thing that he sort of rejects, he also says that the uh, Rates of Republic Bayern or like the, um, the socialist state of Bayern failed because it failed to lead during a revolutionary period and chose to stay with the masses, even though in um, the opinion of like the, the communists, the Bavarian communists was that they were making a mistake, right? Um, and I actually have a quote it's from page 11 at the bottom of the, uh, that I want to uh, quickly read out, um, to repeat the same slogans that the masses are already saying without taking into account the vast context of the revolution is not a communist, but an independent procedure. If we communists have always unconditionally to adopt the same positions as the masses, if we have always to fight for whatever may be their aims at any given moment, we shall resign not only our political right to our own self-determination, we shall, moreover, repudiate our leading role in the revolution. We shall no longer be its head, but its tail. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting, like, this critique um, saying that, like, for instance, like the Bavarian communists, like they, they failed to lead in a time uh, when they sort of, you could say, made it further than the Hungarians in the sense that they didn't sort of get caught up with uh, like uh, socialist unity. Um, and they kind of refused to like uh, to, to agree with like the majority of the social democrats or the, uh, the independents. Uh, and so I find that really interesting uh, as a critique to uh, Radek's position. And uh, one of the things I've also found quite interesting uh, was the, his choice to quote Lenin 
when he said, um, it is not enough to be a revolutionary and an adherent of socialism or a communist in general. You must be able at each particular moment to find the particular link in the chain which you must grasp with all your might in order to hold the whole chain and to prepare firmly for the transition to the next link. From this point of view, it is by no means to retreat, but on the contrary, to lay an enduring hold on the revolution when we issue tactics slogans which enable a certain or foreseeable defeat to be avoided. Um, and, um, and very interesting as well as Levi or Levy, um, he rejects the uh, sort of the the idea like the gallows. Uh, he says like the the Soviet Union didn't or the um, the Bolsheviks they didn't use like a symbol of the gallows next to like the the hammer and the sickle. And so like he personally disagrees with the idea of um, of. Uh, Sort of, I guess, violence in this sense, or you know, in in erecting the gallows as you're uh, uniting with the workers. Um, Melody, is there anything you want to add, or so I don't just drag no, on? <laughs> no, no, that's fine. You're this is great. Um, th uh, welcome to everyone who is uh, joining us. By the way, uh, I think a couple more folks have joined. We got fourteen people watching. So uh, if you've just joining us. Uh, recently uh welcome uh i'm going to remind folks to uh that this is very much a, a participatory uh stream so shout out your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to them um and feel free to drop your thoughts too like you know we're here yakking for two hours so uh, you know be f absolutely feel free to um to join in and um you know give your thoughts there's no no bad questions uh, here, uh, and I guess uh, if there's a place to have a hot take about something, it's got to be in an environment where you're amongst comrades. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, keep that uh, in mind. Uh, and I am once again going to just, I am once again asking for your financial support. Um, <laughs> gonna please uh, help support the show. Uh, by uh, sharing this on your social media, on your Twitter, your uh, Facebook, and uh, your uh, whatever, your Discord servers, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and please uh, help me um, by uh, supporting me on Patreon. I'm just making money through guitar lessons right now because I... Uh, I, my job won't let me, uh, <laughs> um, oof, yeah, things are rough. So, um, that's a, a good way to support the channel is to, um, uh, support me through Patreon and I will give my co-hosts a chance at the end to plug, uh, ways that our, our folks can support you as well. So with that out of the way, uh, Izzy, are you ready to, uh, do chapter 21? Uh, not even close. Um, well, feel free to really ask it. for feel free to ask for support here because you know this is a collective I, effort. I desperately, mm. I, I desperately need it because I uh, have been trying to take notes while everybody else has been summarizing, and I haven't been able to focus. And I lost my notes earlier today because my notebook decided to up and disappear. Um, it is it has not been a uh, not not been a good one today. All right. Well, I think we can all pitch in and uh, cover chapter 21 together, if that's okay with everyone. That is, that would be great. I'm yeah, so sure. sorry. No worries. You got people here to help. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like, I, I don't have much. So far. Um, yeah. I got uh. Well, why don't I pull up chapter 21 on my computer, um, and we can all kind of maybe start by reading along a little bit, and then we can just uh, pick things up from there. How do you say to that? That sounds awesome. Cool. And I will have 
I will have it up on my screen so that our audience can read along too. Hopefully that it's legible. <clears throat> so um, I guess we can maybe take turns on this. So uh, uh, we're on page uh, 450 in the PDF, which is page 421 uh, in the real book, in the physical book. Um, so maybe do we want to just go around and read the first couple of paragraphs starting there? Um, Izzy, you can do that, or I can start, or Kyle, or okay. Simba, or Alki. That's fine, too. How do you want to do this? I guess I'll uh, start it off since I, since I picked this one. Okay. The first commenter, uh, first commenter in Congress had provided only limited participation for the non-Russian delegates, who were mostly not mandated. The second Congress, however, saw an influx of foreign delegates. Uh, for some months, the current in uh, uh, favor of joining the Third International had been growing stronger and uh, in, in all uh, the socialist parties of the world. The Norwegian and Italian parties had given their support. Uh, mass parties as important as the French Socialist Party and uh, the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany were uh, knocking at the door of the International. Uh, the attraction of which was likewise being felt by the syndicalist forces such as the industrial workers of the world in America and um, mass uh, trade union organizations such as the CNT in uh, Spain. This uh, political uh, situation was uh, mapped in uh, the closing months of the Civil War with a favorable mi military situation for the Soviet Republic. At the end of a uh, April of 1920, uh, Marshal uh, Pisulski, Pisulski. His, uh, Pisulski, uh, uh, government in Poland attacked the so Soviet uh, attacked Soviet Russia, reviving the civil war, uh, which uh, during I guess Wrangel mm -hmm. uh, backed by uh, backed and financed uh, uh, by the fi uh, French government was leading in the southwest of Russia. Um, at first, the Soviet uh, government had feared a general attack by the uh, what's that? Entente. Entente in support of uh, uh, Polish offensive, and uh, Radek had warned uh, the Zentral of uh, the uh, of the K KPD that uh, the Polish conflict uh, opened up new ominous perspectives on 18 uh, on. Uh, the 18th of May, a manifesto of the ECCI launched an appeal to the world proletariat for the defense by all means of the Soviet Russia against uh, white Poland. But in July, uh, the war took a turn which surprised many. The Red Army, under the com command of uh, Mikhail uh, help please. Tukhachevsky. Um, Tukhachevsky. Yeah. Thank you. Um routed the Polish army, uh, counterattacked, and marched on Warsaw. Thank you, Izzy. Um, so uh, I am asking my co-hosts now, uh, how do you want to proceed here? Do any of you have uh, Chapter 21 uh, summary, or uh, would you like to kind of keep taking turns reading? I, I, know, I don't want to read the whole chapter, of course, because that will be here all day, But um, and I want to make sure that we get to, uh, through our um through our summaries and on to our discussion period so i'm gonna ask uh you guys to i'm gonna ask for your input so hey hey mel why don't we go What's around up? and give our why don't we give our takes on the chapter sure uh, yeah. if you have if you if you wouldn't mind starting we could just give a quick take uh on sort of uh just what we thought of it and i imagine it'll come together and we'll just if we need to define terminology yeah. or people as we go along yeah. i think that'll like be great I'm going to go ahead and skip then. I'm going to let you guys okay. uh, take take that over because uh, I did I already did quite a bit of talking for my uh, for my section. So uh, and uh, less people talking is probably good. So uh, yeah, please let's uh, give our our thoughts here. Well, if I had, if I had to summarize it in uh, a minute. Because if I say a minute, it'll be fifteen. So I'm going to try and I'm going to try and do a minute. Um, is that there's more uh, instability, but instability sort of in restabilization. 
uh, because you start to see uh, previous elements that were in uh, the KPD. Uh, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't read this chapter since I did. I did my uh, quick read a couple of days ago. But if I remember correctly. The idea is that uh, in particular, uh, this uh, sort of there was a reunification uh, that was happening and essentially a, a rebirth of a united communist party uh, and that in general it, it Bure seemed to represent it still sort of as this like sort of ruptural event um, as like especially moving into 1920 because now we're getting further and further from the context of the context of World War one is going to hang in the air constantly throughout all of this but the most immediate context and now the blowback and the aftermath have been like really, really ramping up. And so you see sort of, and in contrast with last week uh, and uh, the week before, I would say too, uh, in contrast to the very sort of like grim shit that uh, <laughs> we, we, we it, it would like, we'd have one, someone would summarize a chapter and it's like, look at all this cool stuff and the next one, it all falls apart. And, and some cool, oh, uh, well, uh, here, here, here it goes again. Now there's a counter revolution. Now there's a split. Now there's that. Well, it seems like uh, as the uh, the title is, of the chapter itself is The Great Hope of 1920, uh, hopes, sorry, plural, um, and uh, the idea is that there is optimism sort of reemerging um, in spite of, uh, as Brewe does really well, one of his strengths, uh, illustrating some elements of conflict that were happening beh behind the scene. But the emphasis I remember he placed on at the end was the idea that elements of the old guard of the KPD were sort of unifying with other elements, and that's where the main uh, optimism was coming from, unless I'm mistaken about literally any of that. Yeah, I think this is probably also a good point to interject because it's all happening during 1920. Uh, this is where uh, Katz, Kotsky and uh, good old Trotsky get into it uh, because Kotsky... Uh, publishes a pamphlet called uh, Terrorism and Communism, uh, which is basically Kotsky wagging his fingers at the Bolsheviks for doing the Red Terror. And um, Trotsky responds with a pamphlet of the same name, Terrorism and Communism, which is a defense of the Red Terror. And it's basically ca uh, him calling Kotsky to task, being like, okay, listen here, you little shit. We're dealing with, you have no fucking idea what we're dealing with here. Like, um, I'm going to try to, while you guys keep summarizing and discussing, I'm going to try to find the quote that I'm thinking of because I've got the book in front of me. So, um, but he just like rips Kautsky a new one for, um, for, you know, basically, uh, you know, criticizing them for, for employing, uh, the Red Terror. So I'm going to let you guys keep talking while I try to find the quote. <laughs> Anybody want to talk about the uh, so-called draconian conditions of ent entering the uh, Second Party Congress? Do you want to talk about them, Simba? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I, I think that it's kind of funny that Brue talks about them openly as uh, draconian conditions. Yes. Uh, but but uh, these were just, I mean, I think somebody mentioned them earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but the the so the very, very first one, if I remember uh, correctly, was about propaganda mm -hmm. and uh, about how all of the propaganda had to distinctly be like anti-reformist, anti-... Um, pacifist and and as a as a consequence of that a lot of the uh propaganda was distributed or um targeted like the military um for the purpose of of developing um illegal paramilitary like organ sorts of organizations um which you know sound sounds very russian at this time probably especially because of like the horrible condition <laughs> that, that the country is i mean like we can we can say that like from a bird's eye view, Russia is very, very organized, but on the ground things are chaotic and uh, shits, shits wild, especially after being invaded by Poland or being attacked by Poland. Yes. Um, the ninth condition was against ultra leftists, though. Yeah, it was uh, against um, ultra leftists for the for the purposes of uh, establishing uh, democratic centralism, which at this time was like incredibly 
it was an incredibly incredibly important idea even though i don't know that it was uh fully formed yet can anybody confirm or deny that uh well i mean it it, it would i i think in the, within the context of like the trajectory of of centralism like that it just poses one additional qu- question: Did centralism continue to sort of like evolve and shape as it uh, moved into various other both political and social contexts? And yeah, totally, I would say, okay. um, even in the next ten years, uh, uh, things, uh, you know, with with it, that's what's interesting. And I, I think I think you brought up probably the most interesting part uh, segments of the chapter that sort of pulls out the valuable information. I think, um, which is that. Uh, I, I find I find interesting how the stories in this book and, and during these events sort of map on to just how we are sort of supposed to look at history um, in general. I'm not going to go on a big, long thing about that, but what I think is interesting is how, you know, th- th- the same idea that they had for centralism as something that was either you know, centralism or, you know, ultra leftism or syndicalist sort of, you know, what, what have you, um, being in various stages of development. Um, and then uh, understanding that the uh, trajectory of this development both was outside of the imagination of these individuals, as well as is for us, unless we're willing to uh, sort of place it in a bigger scheme, which can make Brue kind of uh, not. An, it can make this book still not enough for like understanding all the fucking shit that was happening. Show Anyways, that, apologies. Sh- show that pretty baby off again, so our audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my this gosh. is what we in the discipline call a fucking doorstop. That's the technical Sh- term for it. Show the pretty and cover. The car. It's the hay- it's haymarket, so you know it's the shit. Gorgeous. Good. <laughs> oh, it's so gorgeous. It's good, right? It's and, a lot mm-hmm. better than the the Brill cover for it. The Brill cover is ugly as shit. <laughs> Brill always just has like weird, like burnt oranges or like <laughs> blues and stuff. It's so ugly. Yeah, the cover, <laughs> the Brill cover of this one is literally gray. It's like this oh, gross, gosh, washed yeah. out gray. <laughs> um, I, I no hate on Brill. I love them as a publisher. They're just not very aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Um, but I do need to cut in. Just to say real quick that I think we should move on to Simba's summary so that we can uh, move on to discussion because we're getting a little behind on time here and I want to respect everyone's time and especially our uh, guest co-host here. So I just wanted to I insert the tro- quote from um, Trotsky in his reply to Kotsky's uh, uh, hand-wringing about the Red Terror. Um The revolution brings to us, Kotsky complains, a bloody terrorism carried out by socialist governments. The Bolsheviks in Russia first stepped onto this path and were, consequently, sternly condemned by all socialists who had not adopted the Bolshevik point of view, including the socialists of the German majority. But as soon as the latter found themselves threatened in their supremacy, they had... recourse to the methods of the same terrorist regime which attacked in the East. That's my, that's my warbling Kautsky impression. <laughs> Trotsky says, It would seem that from this follows the conclusion that terrorism is more profoundly bound up with the nature of revolution than the s- certain sages think. But Kautsky reaches an absolutely opposite conclusion. The gigantic development of white and red terrorism in all the last revolutions, the Russian, the German, the Austrian, and the Hungarian, is evidence to him that these revolutions turned aside from their true path and turned out not to be the revolution they ought to be, uh, have uh, have been, and according to the theoretical visions of Kotsky. Without going into the question of whether terrorism as such is imminent to the revolution as such, let us consider a few of the revolutions as they pass before us in the living history of mankind. So Trotsky is just salty as hell here. And like, this is, I don't like a lot of Trotsky, but like, this is, this is one of his best. This is kind of Trotsky at his best. Trotsky is at his best when he's kind of at his most like, uh, bloodthirsty for lack of better word. Like maybe not the right word. Like, when he's like most adamant about defending the victory of the revolution, I guess, because he's just like, yeah, there's red terror. We have 
white terror like you wouldn't believe we're trying to fight fire with fire fuck you for trying to like moralize us about this shit we have you know we're trying to hold on to power with everything we've got and yeah we're employing some gross methods and we're not exactly jazzed about it ourselves but hey what are you gonna do anyhow um simba let's go ahead and move on to your summary so that we can get in discussion Can't hear you, Simba. You're muted. Yeah, I'm gonna say my summary and be right back. Do you hear that? Yeah, yeah, cool. we're good. All right, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, my chapter is like the the shortest, I think. So by far the shortest, actually. Never mind. Uh, so I think it'll probably be a pretty short summary as well. Um, this is kind of I don't want to say a biographical sketch uh, as much of like an ideological exploration of Paul Levi as as a person and his place in uh, in in the movement. And it's uh, properly entitled, I think, a German conception of communism, uh, which, um, you know, like this whole thing is like like Paul Levi or Levy, as I think uh, one of you guys pronounced it, was like a very German dude, it seems like. Um, so it starts with uh, Levy's strictly inter- internationalist view, saying that there are no uh, German events specifically in the in the World Revolution, and uh, he also emphasized correctly, in my opinion, uh, an asymmetric development of uh, capitalism in different places and in turn socialism. For example, he uh, claimed that the U.S. was the mo- in the most uh, advanced stage of capitalism, but the most primitive stage stage of uh, so- uh, socialist development. Uh, and he mentions the IWW, I think, or at least Bruet mentions the IWW. Uh, so shout outs. But but he didn't mention us on good good terms. And for reference, I'm a wobbly. So in any mm-hmm. case, um, continuing on. Uh, Levy also said that the uh, one of the largest roadblocks in socialist development in Western Europe in general uh, was not the bourgeoisie uh, organizations, but the socialist ones, because they were organized wrong, uh, in his opinion. Which means that uh, Levi also believed that um, the German Revolution specifically had to be, had to be different. Like, his idea of, of the problems with organization in Germany, um, like, he, he drew a clear distinction between those and the problems with, with uh, Russia. Uh, which is to say that he favored uh, like a council communism style uh, method in Germany, but like the Russians are doing Russian stuff. He's not going to worry about that. Um, and and uh, to to go on on that, like from February to October in 1917 in Russia, the uh, proletariat was one to communism, as we all know, and uh, Bruwe says, and that wasn't so much the case in Germany from 1918 to 1919. Uh, in Levi's opinion, and that was because November uh, 1918 specifically was less of a, a win for the proletariat and more of a collapse of the bourgeoisie uh, in the country. And Levi thought that that problem, once again, could be solved by like like council communism. Um, and and uh, the Germans, the Germans at the time, like kind of, or pretty much everybody like saw like the Russian revolution happen. Like you got to remember in 1917 and was kind of like, Hey, let's just do that. And my dogs. Hopefully you guys, did you hear my dogs or not? <laughs> yes. And we liked it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll That's hope that they're, they're not too loud <laughs> as I say that. All right. I'm going to keep going now. Um, so Levy kind of had like a, a hands-off-ish approach. Really, it was eclectic, but like uh, this particular uh, chapter communicates sort, sort of a hands-off approach, or at least that's how I interpret it, uh, which leaves the necessary conclusion that the party should just be a historical instrument for just, uh, deciding class conflict, uh, which was contrary to a whole lot of other uh, socialist of his time that believed that the party was like everything uh, to refer back to the the draconian rules for joining the second common turn congress uh, it was it was very not hands off and levy didn't didn't seem pro that which led to a, a crush, questionable relationship between uh, him and the ECCI 
Um, but, but uh, yeah, and one sec. But Levi uh, and the leaders of the VKPD didn't so much care that the unity of the communist parties was manufactured in a sense by Russia because, you know, history, as we know, is, is a dialectical process. And inevitably, uh, the outcome, or at least Levi and or Levy and the other uh, leaders of the VKPD, led to the, the necessary homogene- homogeneity for what was eventually to become an effective uh, left-wing movement. And that's sort of where the chapter ends, uh, aside from that, yeah, Levy, as a result of all this, kind of had a questionable relationship uh, with Russia. Any Anybody want to make remarks on that? Correct me wherever necessary? Or... No, that, that was good. And I, I think it plays to the point that, like, the the theme of the stream, if you will, which is not all is as it seems, not all is, Ill, is as simple as it seems. And when you look at the sources that are involved, even the the public sources, like on the record sources, as alongside of you know correspondence evidence and that kind of a thing, you can see uh, just that uh, you know the the most the most simple thing that we can the most simple yet the most important thing that we can glean from using a, a historical uh, evidence, primary sources, sources that were created in that particular time period by people experiencing that those events um, uh, to just complicate our idea of things, which is kind of, uh, being a historian fucking sucks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet. I love it. I'll be right back. <laughs> sure, no worries. Um, so we're going to move on into our discussion period now. So we spent... A little bit more time than usual summarizing, but that's okay, because sometimes that happens. Sometimes we're going through a more uh, lengthy section of the book, and sometimes we're going through a little bit more uh, dense section of the book, so it takes a little extra time, and so on. So um, I want to open up discussion. We do discussion pretty freeform here, so we don't have any super strict guidelines um, about uh, you know how to... Uh, participate. Uh, there's, you know, just obviously uh, we're all comrades here, so uh, not be uh, jerks to each other. So uh, <laughs> that, I feel like that's may, may go without saying, but um, just to uh, maybe kind of prime the discussion, I guess, like uh, ask some pr- provocative questions that'll get people's gears turning. Um, Want to ask, like, especially what do we think that this uh, chapter selection can teach us about what the socialist movement needs to do today, what kind of pitfalls it needs to avoid, and so on. Um, And again, I'm going to take a moment to remind our chat, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's so important that you're here and participating in this. I hope that uh, many of you are reading along. I know it's a very hard book to read. That's why we're here. we're here to put our heads together and make sense of it. So, um, yeah, if you have your questions and comments, please be absolutely feel free to um, drop those in the chat, and we will do our best to um, talk about and incorporate your thoughts and feelings into our discussion. That's the benefit of doing a big public live study group like this, and I really want to like emphasize um, the character of the way that we do this that way. So um, without further ado, let's maybe um, center, let's ask questions about, um, you know, how is this relevant today? And if uh, I think some of us are more familiar with Lenin's left-wing communism than others, maybe we want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm going to really leave it up to you guys, especially, and Alki, since you are our guest today, I would really love to kind of center your voice and hear what you have to say. So uh, I'm going to stop yakking and let you guys take over. So please have at it, my friends. Um. Okay, well, I think the first thing uh, to sort of get from this, uh, I... So when I first started learning about history and German history during the early uh, 20th century, uh, I I remember distinctly being like, wow, 1920 was a ridiculous year. And uh, as we've been going through this text, I've kind of realized, wow, 
19, wow, 1920 in just even Germany itself was a ridiculous year. Um, it's, it's, I think one of the, 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 the funniest things about it is just looking sort of at how Lenin and uh, the Soviets basically are looking at this, right? They're looking at what's going on in Germany. Like this is now, now's the time. This is a great time in order to be able to have a Western European like revolution. And what they're essentially working with is one party um, who they see, you know, most of their support is going to probably come from this party, which is the USPD, right? And then they have not one, but two <laughs> communist parties that one of which um, they see as the, the legitimate communist party um based on tactics and is that there's actually a very interesting uh uh description of i think it's apple apple and jung yeah apple and jung uh from the kapd and they visit like this you know the soviet russia and it's interesting that they're Met not with exactly the warmest of welcome. Like they're met with some, you know, fraternity, but not really with the warm welcome. And how the leadership in Russia, they see the KPD, the KPD, or the, the KPD, the Communist Party, as the legitimate Communist Party, the one that has the correct tactics, as opposed to the KAPD or the, um, the Communist Workers' Party of Germany. And... Um, one of the things that I found pretty interesting is 1920 very much is a year where they're trying to figure out how on earth do we form sort of a, a unity, like a unified communist party? How on earth are we going to do this? And what's interesting is that, for instance, the ECCI, basically it seems like their tactic was, okay, we need to get like the spirit of the, the German Workers' Party, right? The spirit of that, right? We need them to sort of correct like the opportunist side of the USPD and actually take this, you know, a lot of support from the USPD. But then we also need them to sort of combat the KPDs, like, um, for lack of a better word, um, like passiveness, like, and what they they really need is like some sort of combination of what the three parties, you know, essentially are. And I find it really interesting to see how it's like, for instance, like this is stated in chapter 20 and then like the fallout in 21 um, and the eventual realization of uh, the fall of the USPD, but then a unified, in quotes, uh, communist party um but one thing i kind of want to like relate this to like modern day is um and i kind of want to go back slightly to the thing with the gallows talking about how um that was that wasn't supposed to be like that wasn't the symbol alongside like the um the sickle and the hammer and it's kind of interesting thinking about it today because like the guillotine is that is sort of our symbol. That's a symbol that we kind of meet with. However, I'm, I, I often ask myself, like, is it, at what point does it stop becoming a meme, you know? And um, is that a symbol that, I mean, not a lot of leftists, I would say, use that as, like, sort of a symbol. Um, but is that, like, sort of a symbol that we should be propping up as much as we do? Um, I mean, you know, of course, you know, people will say it's just memes or everything, but uh, that's just kind of one of the things I've kind of wanted to talk about because it's something I've thought about over the course of the past year or so, uh, but now more so after having seen um, Levy's uh, response to Radic. Yeah. Well, I really, I wanted to jump in with what you were saying there about the guillotine thing because I think like, and this whole like infantile disorder thing and the youthfulness, I guess, of of the sort of socialist movement here in the United States, which is that, you know, I think a lot of us, I mean, like most of us, I think here on this stream are in our twenties and thirties. 
And like that's all we're all kind of in the same age group as these people in the in the communist movement in Germany then. But we're in, I think, a very decidedly different condition because like the working class in Germany at this time was like really powerful and strong. And like despite these contradictions that were within it, like they had been a fighting movement basically since like the 1860s, right? So the U.S. working class, on the other hand, is way more schismatic and way more, like, like the radicals are, you know, we're uh, scattered like little, you know, in little pockets here and there. We're even kind of worse off than the KPD was. Like, we're not just like, you know, an, a big isolated thing. We're just like isolated, isolated within isolated within isolated, right? Like, I think that that we're coming out of that condition in a lot of ways, because a lot of people are radicalizing, and that's definitely good. Um, so uh, there's that. But just on the guillotine real quick, and then I'll pass things off back to you guys, which is, I think the guillotine just has so much resonance right now, because that's kind of, like, all that our, that the, that the, the public sentiment really has to go on. Like, besides, like, kind of you know, Bernie putting out Medicare for all or free college or whatever, like those are definitely demands that people have, but they're not like, like a platform of demands that like a movement has their, their, their demands there that, you know, he has on his platform that just happen to have mass support, right? There's not like a communist movement saying, or a socialist movement really in the in the big sense of the word like there's you know there's there, there are socialists as opposed to like a movement anyway so i guess with the guillotine again sorry i keep rambling but like the guillotine is like the one kind of condensed piece of of fuck this shit that everyone can kind of get behind without getting into a million stupid conversations about well anarchism or marxism or or you know council democracy or soviet this or you know syndicalism that exactly you know like those are conversations that are happening between people like us but like nobody in the public is really having these conversations like and i think that's going to change and i think that we can help make that change for sure but like i think we're just really kind of at this very primordial stage. And I think that, you know, but, and I think that's also very dangerous because the, you know, the government is so powerful here, is at least in the United States, it's so powerful, so overbearing, you know, the surveillance state is, obs is, you know, absolutely everywhere up in our shit. Hi, hi, FBI. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, just like, uh, we're just, I think, in a much more, like, dangerous situation given the ascendancy of, like, a quasi-state-sanctioned, you know, far right here that's very openly, you know, taking lives and, and you know, hurting people. Um, and I don't think that, you know, our movement has as much, has the kind of, like, we have, definitely have good people on our side and we have lots of people willing to, you know, fight and put their, put their shit on the line, but, like, it's, it's again. It's, I'm, I'm stressing that this is all very primordial, I guess, and that's what I'll that's what I'll end on. And you guys can go off. I think this is all an interesting conversation, and actually something of a like. A, well, we know it's topical, but I think it has a good deal of significance. Like even before we broaden it, but when we do broaden it, we sort of run into some things that I think that are kind of important for start. You know, how, how do symbols and signs themselves uh, interplay with the way that human beings communicate with each other, with the way that those symbols and signs sort of project their own ideas based off of various contexts, various other sort of perceptions of individual people, uh, sort of us as like a subject, if you will, in this sort of, you know, story that we live in, that's our lives. We have the some we have a, a, a elements of various experiences through which that we can use to conceptualize how things mean and that sort of a thing. This is all like just to say that we, I, I speak slowly on that because when you start to get into sign and symbol 
uh, uh, semiotics, uh, as we would call it academically, uh, you start to get into some fishy territory and you start to get real gobbledygooky. So, you know, whoa, I'm not going to Whoa there, promise. boys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> promise, promise. But I actually think that this matters uh, because the, the main critique that someone could say, if you're opposing like a theoretical or an academic critique toward the idea of like guillotine meme equal good. Um, guillotine meme is fun. Guillotine meme acts as catharsis for me. That's part of the reason why I like them. And it also is a symbol that's had a long sort of historical significance that's been sort of changed and recontextualized, you know, as a form, as a symbol of punitive, like ec the exercising of like harsh justice. We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. Yeah, I made the joke. It's like, hi, FBI. Five minutes later, stream gets cut. <laughs> <laughs> People will be worried. <laughs> you never happened before. It happens all the fucking time. I can't, like... I had. I was supposed to get on Twitch at, what was it, 7 o'clock? 7.30. And then the capture card that I've used six times now to that was worked perfectly effectively decided to not work for 45 straight minutes of trouble. I'm just like unplugging, plugging it back in, plugging it in a different order, but nothing yeah. was working. And it was like, there are tiny little gremlins that have, I've <laughs> or have been cursed by like one of the bad witches or something like, I, yeah. like what the fuck is happening? A capitalist so, witch cursed me. I'm going to, I'm going to need to do some wizardry here. Cause, uh, Oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Oh well, it shit happens. Whatever. It's it's really like okay. it really does. All right. Well, if everyone's here, we might as well just kind of uh, pick things back up. So, a uh, little hiccup, but uh, no worries. Yes, Zahn, you are in the right place. Uh, Zahn, sorry, sorry for the interruption, Hi. but we should be back now. Yeah. Hold on. I'm making sure this is working. Yep. There we go. So, yeah. um, Kyle, you were going on about signs and signifieds, and don't go too okay. ham with that. But uh, <laughs> that, it was a good thing that you. Uh, uh, so my, uh, uh, I, I started to talk about Jean Baudrillard, and Melody just killed the stream instinctively. Like she's just like ah. straight to gulag. <laughs> <laughs> You're I, discussing I just, idealist postmodernism. Go, do not pass go. Go directly to Gulag. I got put against the wall <laughs> for citing the revisionist Jean Baudrillard. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, basically, the idea is that, like, you know, a, a, a guillotine is not just sort of a, a symbol that's outside of time and space, right? It doesn't exist in a vacuum, as we talk about. So when we start to complicate the idea of what. Uh, uh, the symbol of a guillotine actually means, um, I think where the critique of these said uh, revisionist postmodernists uh, is actually useful for leftists um, to sort of check, uh, to, to act as a, like sort of a point of critique, like, okay, symbols and signs aren't necessarily as neat uh, and neatly wrapped up as uh, we think they are because of various points of interpretation, because of the process of sort of literary interpretation where you start to examine these binaries that like uh, you can complicate and sort of, you know, realize that the, the, the binaries themselves can often sort of, they seem like they're encapsulating all of that meaning, but they maybe aren't. Like these are, you know, like points of, uh, that, that's the sort of, that's basically deconstruction. If everyone ever, if anyone ever goes on and on about Derrida, that's basically what Derrida is doing. Um, and Marxists have moved on past through uh, through the post-structuralists and these types of, you know, you know, French assholes uh, who are complicating everyone's sort of philosophical worldview and have really tried to use it. And I think in a really substantial way, um, a substantive, I mean, substantive way. Um, and the point that I want to make with this is that um, if I'm giving my personal take on pro or anti guillotine, I'm actually pro uh, meme uh, or, you know, and in general, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would be on the pro side of it, um, and here's why. Um, there is this, there's this double edge to the si kind of signs and symbols that we see. The critique that you hear oftentimes is usually uh, uh, a uh, this is too scary critique, um, sort of the idea that like 
the the inherent violence that's projected in this symbol is a scary violence that's going to put off people and it's going to scare them. But I would actually like to leverage the post-structuralist critique at that particular understanding of what a guillotine meme is by saying, uh, who says that working class people are like completely afraid and terrified of all kinds of violence in all kinds of contexts? Because that would complicate our idea of what violence actually means for that as well. And the other critique that I would pose is that um, oftentimes these sort of like, this is inappropriate, this is not acceptable uh, critiques, um, while they may in various contexts be correct, no matter who's leveraging them, someone who's an economic liberal or someone who's an actual leftist, and I know leftists who don't really like this kind of a thing, but I would want to, and I think that's fair, and I think that's actually important to take into account. But I think also the next step after that is to then turn it around and say, OK, who, for whose acceptability are we taking this, you know, chop, chop, motherfucker stuff out of our rhetoric? And what exactly are we missing and who exactly can see that we're missing something when we do that exactly? So I think what's useful. So that's there. There's the argument that there's a drawback to using a violent symbol because it scares people. But if you say, okay, well, let's say that that's a liberal critique, and then how do we talk about a sign or a symbol that has a discourse of violence associated with it uh, in a way that maybe could be useful for people? Um, and I think we've actually, y'all have nodded at several already. One, uh, a feeling of empowerment when we are so you know, atomized and alienated as Melody, and I think in a way Alki was talking about as well, um, as we're so sort of separated from, you know, one another and how our s particular contemporary situation is very different from situations in the past that had much more organized working class. And we're also in like neoliberal hell. So uh, everything's really different and it's even worse. Um, like there is something about the re-empowerment against all odds and seemingly against all sort of like ideas out there they're, they're in so there's they're sort of two sides of this and i think one of them is a really common thing we hear that's great and i'm not going to go into them in details and the other one is an argument we don't hear as much that's maybe going to kind of sort of be in a video that i'm putting out in a couple of days sort of <laughs> on the one side we have the usual uh argument that we hear a lot uh which uh is was phrased by mark fisher but uh, originally said uh by frederick jameson which is this uh, li capitalism limits our imaginations and our ability to see a world outside of it. The quote being, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. I think that may be relevant to some people right now. Um, and then the other argument is, the, uh, is how um, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri wrote a book called Empire um, that they uh, insert, they reused a couple of philosophical ideas uh, one of them that was used mostly, uh, that was popularized in a new way by a post-structuralist, I think it's a great idea, um, the idea of what they call biopower, as Michel Foucault would be the theorist there. I'm not going to get into that. Um, in this book, Hart and Negri are examining Empire, capital E, as this bigger idea, the sort of, the thing that happens after imperialism. Once imperialism and once capital started to grow and grow and grow and grow, and once globalization happened, all of a sudden this diffusing of power goes into the way that we interact with each other, our social institutions. Like in general, the <laughs> world is shaped around us by this yeah. diffusing of a power of empire. Uh, wow. As a you know, yeah. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. You yeah, have yeah, been hogging the mic for a minute, so I just wanted to. Oh, okay. Wrestle it back from you for a sec uh, sure. and make sure our other co-hosts get a chance to speak as well. Uh, and yeah, just on that uh, Hart and Negri book real quick, uh, the book that I just finished, which I'm totally going to box up and send you in the mail, is uh, Crisis and Hegemonic Transitions by L uh, Lorenzo Fusaro, which basically uh, critiques Hart and Negri on this and basically says, well, uh what, not so fast there with your uh, abandonment of classical uh, Leninist uh, um, theory of him mm. doesn't mean that it's any less dangerous and any less like monolithic. Like this is uh, also John Smith's critique of David Harvey in his uh, Imperialism in the 21st Century. Um, David Harvey critiques uh, 
or excuse me, John Smith critiques David Harvey's uh, so theory of so-called new imperialism for basically doing the same thing in a different way, which is to say that like, oh, because now because there's other challengers to U.S. hegemony, that necessarily means that like imperialism functions differently or whatever. And uh, John Smith is basically like, that's a bunch of horse shit. That's like basically uh, skirting the issue and pretending that things are a lot more different than they really are. Um, but we can get into that some other time because that's, I mean, it's pertinent, but it's a, a little bit too off the be beaten track here. So uh, Alki and uh, Izzy, you want to jump in here? I'm a, I'm a, about to have to hop off here. Oh, okay. Well, why don't you get in your last yeah. word then? Um, I, I, uh, don't really have one. <laughs> I was, I was kind of listening to Kyle. <laughs> it's okay. If that's, if that's it for you, then that's it. Don't worry about it. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. You don't have anything to apologize for. This is, uh, you're amongst comrades here always. Yeah. But um yeah like that that's been one thing um the the guillotine question or the guillotine question has been something I've I've thought about and it's it's one of those symbols that like me personally I don't have a problem with and uh though I don't like I don't really meme with it cuz I don't really meme all that much um at least on like my twitter or anything um it's one of those symbols that I don't necessarily uh when I see liberal critiques of it um in the past, I usually just don't don't engage with it. Like, um, it was basically this year engaging with uh, another good friend of mine who um, who uh, we both went to the same university, uh, and they're a liberal. And like, they started sort of talking to me about it, and that's when I started actually putting some thought into it. Um, and it's something I've kind of put on the back. But then once I started reading the chapter and I saw uh, the critique about using it as a symbol. Or uh, Levy's uh, critique of basically saying that you know they, the Hungarian movement or, or the uh, for instance the uh, the Russian Revolution they didn't use that as a symbol. Uh, it did make me think about um, our modern usage of it. Um, but I, I think I largely agree with Kyle is um, in the sense that I suppose I don't know. I, this is one of those topics that I think I'm definitely going to be thinking about over the course to the next couple of weeks uh, because a friend of mine is thinking about making a video um, about it. And so I might actually help them make that video, but it's definitely a topic that uh, I wanted to raise, but there was um, another topic I kind of wanted to talk about, especially having Kyle here because uh, Kyle and I both talk a lot about labor. Um, and so one of the topics I wanted to bring up is sort of the labor movement going forward and how we look at trade unions. Um, and so we've seen, of course, a decline in like, the rate of union membership since uh, the 70s. And um, the 70s, uh, depending on the sources that you look at, uh, at least about one in three Americans were in uh, unions. And at this point, it's about 10.3% as of, uh, I want to say, this year. And I think the thing that I found really interesting about it is looking at like reviving because that's one of the big goals, or one of the big goals I think we should have of the left is reviving unions within this decade. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do, like with my channel, is like, even amongst people who really don't like unions, you can at least get them to admit that unions had a time and a place, right? And so one of the things I want to do is to tell people, hey, psst. That, that time is still now. Like, we still need unions. And so um, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, for instance, the state of the labor movement now, like your opinion of it, and sort of how do we go forward? And maybe even what can we learn from the 1920s, both not only in America, but in Germany? And what things should we be doing to increase uh, not only just union membership, but really getting workers involved in organized labor? That's a 
rip of a fucking question. I love it. Um, <laughs> so, super important, super pertinent, incredibly relevant. And I can speak this from experience for people who don't know me or my content. I, I talk a lot about theory online, but uh, during the day right now, I'm running around as if I'm on fire, putting out other fires uh because i'm the head of my particular local um and what i can say is happening in my experiences on the ground right now is uh an unbelievable amount of anger and fear and resentment for the exact right people that we need to be resentful against and i think that's the most important takeaway because i like the way you phrased the question historically i think it's significant to think like, okay, how do we integrate this maybe brand new, definitely brand new, I'm going to definitely, um, idea of trade unionism into the broader history of trade unionism, let's say in the United States. And, and the way to do that is, first of all, by admitting what I just said, that this next iteration is never going to look like the ones before it, um, that they've all looked different from one another, and that we have the lens of sort of the historical trajectory of how trade unionism went. Um, but that on the other side of that is that what I've seen and what in my experiences as well is kind of how I got into this whole thing is that the, the, like in I, I know Melody has this sort of same perspective. Alki Al seems to do absolutely as well, considering yeah. the way that we're all invested in like labor history. Oh, as, absolutely. I think we're and, and, all very much kind of of a similar cloth there. Like my Marxist training is Braverman and Moody. And like you guys, I think really <laughs> are uh, come, come from kind of a, a similar theoretical tradition there, if I've surmised correctly. Um, so, just, you know, I, I think we have a lot of common ground there. Actually, my drum teacher has my copy of On New Terrain right now, and I really hope that we get to discuss that book again in the future because it's so important. Um, Shit. But uh, I just wanted to kind of, uh, again, I know like this is a, a fabulous conversation. I want it to kind of keep going, but like also trying to tie this back into the reading because uh, like I'd love to have a stream where we just talk uh labor stuff and that'd be great uh and i don't want to like just like put a brick in, into this conversation i want you guys to to keep going but like just keep that in mind i guess uh unfortunately to that point uh if it's hitting about 8 30 like i think it is i should yeah. wrap up oh, okay well then that's uh let's let you get your last word in then yeah um if there's anything that we see right now more than we have in the past is that we are in a moment uh that is historical um, but I want to complicate that in one way. All of these moments have all been historical, and every single person who is listening to this stream right now is a historical change agent. And you are in several ways, but the way that we choose to focus on in this these contexts in particular is your role as a working member of society that is going to move forward and shape how things happen from here on out. And what matters the most in thinking about how the German Revolution matters right now is that we see that the biggest problem that they were going through, at least according to the book that we're reading, is the idea that they were not, time is literally never on their side. And now we have the glimpse, we have the glasses to look back and see that, oh, time is even less on our side right now because none of, like, we don't have any of it. So the opportunities that we can take, first and foremost, to educate ourselves, like in these contexts, and then secondly, and in my opinion, extremely importantly, figure out a context through which you can engage with your community and organize the people around you. Um, there are tons of resources that I will, I will sit and I will DM you an hour and a half about. If you reach out on Twitter or anything, ask me. You can go to my channel. I did a, labor, a very brief labor organizing training, and we're going to continue to do more. Um, and I think when we live in a precipitous moment, a moment that has an extremely high risk because, well, let's face it, most of the people that I know are still going into work right now, but also a very Same. high reward. Yeah, exactly. Like there's a reward at the end of this that we can see that is more valuable than probably most things that we've experienced so far. And we see it happening in the idea of this grip of capital on people's consciousness is breaking apart under these periods of stress. And while it's terrible 
that the people who have to bear the most are the ones who then have to give back the most in order to actually make things better for everybody. But that's the necessary reality that we need to deal with in moments like this. And that ultimately, I'm here to help anybody who is interested in trying figuring out how to get engaged and how to do it now. Because as someone who's doing a lot of work on the ground right now, holy fucking shit do we need help. I do not have enough capacity for all the projects that keep yeah. popping up in my inbox over the past two weeks. And it's I only going to get worse. We just need yeah. you. So do your thing. I totally second that. We need... It's absolutely exhausting work, and we need more comrades. So please join your local IWW, join DSA, join whatever radical group is doing, you know, boots on the ground. You know, that's, I guess that's kind of always my advice to people who like aren't organized yet and want to get organized and maybe don't know to start. Like, look for the groups who are already around, who are, who are, have, their boots on the ground, they've got their fingers, they're getting their, I mean, they're, excuse me, they're getting their hands dirty, they're doing work that is, you know, like, you know, they're doing mutual aid, or they're doing, um, you know, anti-imperialist, you know, counter demonstrations, that kind of thing. That's the kind of work that you want to get invested in. Look for the groups that are already doing it and ask how you can help. Absolutely. Uh, that's my time. I'll, uh, I'll let y'all keep going. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, we will see you in two weeks. Later, y'all. Be good. Yeah. Um, see you. Alki hey. and Andor Izzy, do you want to get last couple words in? I think the one piece of advice, and I, I, uh, I, I'm on about this a lot on Twitter uh, when I'm not relentlessly shit posting, um, mm-hmm. is people who want to get into organizing. Uh, aside from finding uh, local organizations that are already doing work, what they need to do, uh, or at least attempt to do, is work on an elevator pitch for uh, their ideology and what they're trying to accomplish. Because uh, there are two things that we're trying to like accomplish at the same time. One is get past like I think decades of propaganda. And two, the other thing is trying to make that meme with uh, Peach and Daisy a reality, where she's just like, aren't you tired of being that? Don't you just want to go eight? <laughs> <You're trying laughs> to things together. And trying to, like, make functional, like, organizing out of that. And, that, that's, and that's more, uh, that's easier said than done. Um, so uh, I found that the easiest way to get people on board, in, in my experience, is just is treat it like you're selling a car. Uh, <laughs> this puppy can yeah. fit so much revolutionary praxis in it. Yep. <clears throat> Just learn how to smooth talk a little bit. Learn how to get your talk game real good, uh, or at least good enough where it's it's serviceable. And and work on an elevator pitch. Like just like it's reductive, yeah, but it works. Right on. And uh, where can people find you uh, online? I am uh, at Izzy the Fox. There are underscores in there on uh, Twitter. And um, Izzy does everything on YouTube. Um, I'm about to start doing a series on uh, preparedness, like disaster preparedness, like uh, uh, tactics, things like that on my channel. Uh, basically, like leftist prepping. I'm about to start doing that uh, alongside the other stuff I'm already doing, which is sporadic at best. Um, right on. Because I do not have a lot of um, uh, free time anymore. I have been, uh, I'm, I'm like that, uh, I'm like a Steve Wiggum's kid on the fucking Simpsons. Just, <laughs> I'm essential. Um. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Well, you take care, dear, and you be uh, safe. So, uh, I'll be about that. All right. Uh, Alki, uh, we're, I, have plenty more time to talk. If you want to keep talking, uh, that's up to you. I want to be respectful of your time, though, and if you have to go now, uh, this would be a good time to probably get your last word in, but other than that, I'm happy to keep uh, hosting this conversation with you. Oh, yeah, we can go on. I have a few more minutes. Sure. So, yeah, let's 
yeah, keep. Uh, I guess this is this is your time. So uh, let's. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, let's give it um, to you. Give me one sec. I don't want to pull out. One note here. Okay. So uh, the, one of the really like interesting things that I really found, or one of the reasons why I kind of brought up labor, um, was because of the way that both Lenin and uh, Gorter talk about, like for instance, like the role of trade unions uh, during this time period, during 1920, but like definitely... 1919 kind of uh going into the 20s and talking kind of about how um like for instance like lenin the the general idea is that the workers need to meet the uh or no excuse me the communists need to meet the workers where they're at Mm -hmm. basically um and one of the very interesting things is from the ultra left who are saying like no 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 you know uh, or at least from Gorter, he's saying that basically, more or less, the workers, like in these trade unions, like they they've sort of adopted uh, like bourgeois culture, as he says, or um, this sort of idea that basically, like uh, bourgeois ideals, you know, they've been adopted by the workers within the trade unions, and so we need to replace the trade unions with with workers' unions. Yeah. Um, and so, like, one of the reasons why I kind of brought it up is sort of looking at, um, just kind of looking at history and trying to, like, think back, actually, um, to what a little bit I know about uh, organized labor, at least in Germany during this time period. I've actually found it kind of interesting where basically trade unions should sort of be replaced by not quite what the IWW is, which is like, of course, the one big union, but a sort of a smaller, quote unquote, version of that, which is like similar to, I guess what it would be an industrial union, Mm -hmm. uh, more or less where you have all of the workers within an industry or all the workers within even just workplace to workplace, they're all organized by the same union. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of wanted to like get your opinion sort of on um like the tactics like like uh or at least what do you feel like who do you feel had a better analysis of like trade unions like you know yeah. was it Lenin? was it Gorton? Gort- just your yeah. personal opinion i mean like that's that's really tricky for me to parse because you know like my temptation of course is to always just be like yeah lenin was always right but like no that's even as like somebody who upholds marxism leninism that's not a that's a very false way to look at history like lenin was necessarily wrong about a lot of this stuff because of that stuff that we we're talking earlier about like the you know, the breakdowns in communication and, you know, the bad information and yada, yada, yada. So, like, and, like, just the the very fact of, like, of trying to analyze a situation that you are, A, not in, and B, like, you know, Lenin in 1920 had a civil war on his hands. I think he was probably thinking about other things a lot more of the time, uh, you know, so it's, I think, tempting for me to just be like, yeah, Lenin was right. They should have, you know, s- stayed in the in the uh, backwards trade unions and tried to organize the workers. But, like, at the same time, I really, like, I, I when I read uh, Gorter's uh, uh, response, I was just like, okay, yeah, like, shut up, old man. Kind of, like, <laughs> Lenin kind of not really getting it what's going on there and like you know i think about and like um you probably know more about like american labor history than i do but like my memory serves me like the afl in particularly like in the turn of the of the 20th century had like a lot of problems with like labor aristocracy and racism like samuel gompers was racist as shit yeah. Um, and like the IWW was so like successful in, in its own right there because they were like one of the only unions that, well, for one thing, they were only, only the only like workers 
organizations that even supported the idea of industrial unionism because the predominant thing was trade unionism, which is like, you know, just for those who are listening in, like trade unionism is like organizing or like craft union is like all the shoemakers are in a union and they all organize to keep their wages high and stuff. And in the United States, especially, this was you know, because of the incredibly racist institutions here, disproportionately skilled workers were, uh, for the most part, white and, like, had exclusionary laws about who could and couldn't join their union, uh, you know, so, uh, and then, so the IWW comes in, I think, 1905, right? Yeah. Um, and they're like, well, we're gonna, not only in, uh, we're gonna organize unskilled workers, we're gonna organized industrial workers. God, I hate that term, unskilled workers. It's such a deception. Yeah. Anyway, but um, but they come in and they say, okay, well, we're going to organize those workers. And, well, guess what? That was Chinese workers, black workers, Hispanic workers, you know. So it was uh, a big challenge to a group like the AFL, which was uh, kind of pretty backwards in in those regards very white very um kind of protective of that labor aristocracy and i think we kind of run into the same contradictions today although in kind of a different regard because even the kind of bourgeois reactionary unions that we have like the you know afl cio and the other big unions that are you know, around is that, you know, they, they barely exist themselves, you know, <laughs> like they're big right. and they have, they have a certain amount of pull, but like, I think what, like less than 6% of private sector jobs are unionized. So it's a little bit like, I think we're dealing with very different material here. Anyhow, I kind of got way off track from ask, you asked my opinion on Lenin versus the ultra lefts. And I guess I kind of, went off on a on a tear there but um anyhow uh, i also you would love this book that i have it's um reiner uh, tostoff's uh the red international of labor unions from 1920 to 1937 um and it is just a big thick old book it's like actually i think it's actually bigger than Bruet's book <laughs> it's yeah no it is it's like over 900 pages um Ooh. yeah it's a big boy uh so it's i'm just gonna read the back flap uh the red international of labor uh unions rilu or uh prof in turn was an in, a central instrument of for the spreading of international communism during the interwar period this comprehensive and scholarly history of the organization based on extensive research in the former communist archives in moscow and east berlin um sheds significant light on the international trade union movement of the period Tostov shows how the RILU began as a revolutionary alliance of syndicalists and communists in defiance of the Social Democratic International Federation of Trade Unions. His text provi- uh, presents a full account of the organization's main stages, the decline of the revolutionary wave after the First World War, after which m- many syndicalists left uh, the, and others were integrated into the communist parties, the continuation of RILU as a uh, international communist apparatus and its disillusion in 1936 to 37 as part of communism's popular front policy. And we can get into a whole fucking nightmare of a conversation about what a goddamn disaster the popular front was in so many regards. (laughs) Oh my God. I think like the U S communist movement has never recovered from, from the popular front here. Like, it was already nope. having a rough time, and then like the Popular Front just, uh, oh man, we can we could uh, probably devote like a whole episode to that and to itself. But I hope that I kind of answered your question. Yeah. Um. Uh, the re- the reason I bring it up actually is because sort of looking at the period. Because um, now, yeah, I'll preference this. I, I am an anarchist. Mm-hmm. Um. However, um, I typically, so like my position has always sort of been like, uh, don't tr- try not to just default to, oh man, you know, I don't like X or Y because I'm an anarchist, right? Oh yeah, no, um, I think the I same way. Do, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I still end up doing it. You know, it, we're human. Like, it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, however, um, I think I think that Lennon's analysis was only correct in the sense that, yeah, they, they needed to meet the workers where they were. Yeah. Um, if the workers are in the trade union, they need to do that. It's just, I think... Lennon just really, like, as you said, he didn't really have all the information that he needed necessarily about the, the trade unions. And that's why I think Gorter's response uh, really highlighted the fact that within the trade unions, uh, you have more or less, like, basically, like, this idea of, like, like, the ballot battle or the decisive battle being decided by ballots. And... That wasn't going to work at this uh, at this time period, um, and I think personally, like when I when I read what Lenin wrote, I can understand from his position, looking at the history, why he said it, and and in some respects, I could agree with why he said based on what I think he probably knew at the time. Mm-hmm. But looking at sort of what Gorder has said about the time period, and looking kind of at uh, what limited information I know about the German trade unions, I would definitely agree with Gorder that that a replacing trade unions would have been the better tactic. But uh, at some point, one would say, yeah, you probably do need to either you need to take over trade unions or you have to find a way to um, convince the working class to leave trade unions. Yeah. And, in the year of 1920, I mean, how <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's hilarious. I guess, and this like, is where I, I I find myself agreeing with Lenin a lot more because I think Lenin would have basically said, "Yeah, the right time to do that was like 20 years ago. Where was your mm-hmm. ass?" You know? Yeah. Um, and like, well, that's the thing is that 20 years ago, all these uh, young communists were like three years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, like. Uh, what else? Like, I guess, and again, like, I think there's this, this is, I keep, in all of my conversations about revolutionary movements in general, I really stress uh, two things that were, I think, characteristic of Bolshevism and just the character of the Russian Revolution in general, which is that they had 20 goddamn years of mostly, like, illegal experience. They were not a parliamentary party, first and foremost. They did sometimes run people in the like the Duma and that that kind of thing. But like they were not first and foremost a parliamentary party in the way that we think of them in 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 the West, right? Those parties, like the Democratic or Republican Party in the United States or the SPD here, um, you know, they're very different um, than what the institutions in, you know, pre-revolutionary Russia were, they were illegal, they were operating, you know, under conditions of secrecy, and they had to be very careful about, you know, combining legal with illegal tactics and so on, right? So they had, and they did it for 20 years, and they had, you know, and in the course of that, three revolutions, they had the, the 1905 revolution, and then after that, basically, like, I think three or four years of just brutal, brutal reaction. And the movement goes down to being almost nothing by the start of the war. Um, and it stays that way during the war because of the conditions of wartime repression. But like, it also like, there is continuity through all of this, like the leaders and cadres of the Bolshevik party are developing and through this, like his long historical period. And I think that that's kind of, like again, I I run the risk of kind of romanticizing the Bolsheviks more than I ought to, but like I think that there's a real lesson to be learned there, which is that they had two decades of revolutionary experience that they were drawing from, and when they seized power, and and that that's like the authority that they had earned on the world stage in the socialist movement was to say. We struggled for 20 bitter, hard years, and now we're in the middle of a civil war trying to hang on to power, and goddammit, listen to us. We know how to do this shit, 
even if we're kind of wrong about the conditions in your country or whatever, like, you know, that's, I guess that's kind of why I tend to be more sympathetic with Lenin's analysis, despite the fact that he's clearly wrong about some of this stuff. Yeah, I, I definitely, and of course, you know, it's, we're looking back, of course, 2020. Hindsight. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Um, and so like, like I sort of, uh agree because like i haven't actually i have to reread a lot of my linen stuff because i've read a, a lot of it in german mm. uh, and it was mainly excerpts yeah uh, and I've so sometimes... shamefully shamefully i speak russian but i've never read lenin in russian <laughs> it's don't don't do what i did don't <laughs> don't read it in one language or don't read it in like your second language and then not read it in your first because i feel like see i've that would be me reading it in my first <laughs> See, like, that's like, like <laughs> it's just so bad for me because like some of the stuff that I remember, it's like I'm trying, like trying for me to remember it and then translate it is like I, I that's mm-hmm. one of my weak points, sort of like with German. Um, but when whenever I sort of um kind of go back and I look at Lenin, like my my views on Lenin are not necessarily informed as an anarchist, but like just inform more so like looking at the text and look at it. Cause I feel like, you know, that's, that's sort of, I don't want to say cheating, but that's sort of, I'm going to come to personal conclusions rather than actually, you know, yeah. the real conclusion. If yeah. I just using my, my personal um, uh, take on it. However, I definitely, whenever I look at this period and when I look at kind of what Lennon is saying, like, you're. I think you're definitely right in the sense that, I mean, yeah, they they did it. It's 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 sort of odd. I mean, uh, I understand his critique of the ultra leftists, and I, I disagree with uh, in certain parts. And we get on another stream probably. Yeah, you know, sparks all of that out. Um, but I definitely think that uh, when it came to him stressing, especially. Oh, as a matter of fact, we can pull out the. Uh, the quote mm-hmm. where he says, uh, one second. Uh, where he declares, he says, experiences prove that on certain very important questions of the proletarian revolution, all countries will inevitably have to do what Russia has done. Um, and when I first, because this is not the first time I've actually read that quote, like when I first read that quote, I had very sort of different feelings about it. But now mm. like looking at what I know and having a much better understanding of like the early 20th century and of uh, both, uh, uh, to a certain degree, the Russian revolution, but much more like the German condition, like Lenin was sort of, he was right about that. In mm-hmm. the sense that, hey, we did this. Hey, um, you know, you, listen here, you, all... you young whippersnappers. <laughs> you know, like, like, I, I love to conjure up like the idea of like a boomer basically being like, let me tell you kids how we did. It, you know? Yeah, but, and I mean, Lenin would have been boomer age. He was born in eighteen seventy, I think. Yeah, I think so. So he would have been in nineteen twenty. He would have been fifty years old. Um. But I think another thing that's really important too is like how he stresses that without um basically like without other countries going through their own revolutions like the Russian revolution uh or the Russian social ex- uh socialist experiment as my old professor used to call it um mm-hmm. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't have been able to survive like it needed other socialist movements to take off in western Europe yeah and Lenin is stressing that. He's like, we need you to do this, and we need you to do it now. You yeah, know? and I mean, the, um, Russians, the Russians were acutely aware of, like, long before they had seized power in October, they were acutely aware of how isolated they would be in the international situation if they were able to seize power. They were, I think, very aware, very acutely aware of that, as that uh, quote from uh, Bukharin that I read earlier kind of indicated. Like, they were, you know, this this concept which is 
kind of wrongly attributed to Trotsky of permanent revolution or ongoing revolution uh, was actually, I mean, this is Marx, really. This is a, a concept from Marx that Trotsky develops into his own kind of new thing later, but I don't want to get into that. But basically this idea that like, you know, it's, it's, it, you don't even really need Marx to express it. Like it's just kind of geopolitical sense. Like if you are a backwards, you know, economically backwards country and you're short on resources, you're going to need help period. Like that's just how it is. Yeah. But of course, that's why Germany was such an attractive country. I mean, oh, absolutely. Germ I mean, I think if I remember correctly, like during this time period, but definitely during the uh, Second Industrial Revolution, like Germany was this the world's second uh, steel producer. Like they were number two behind yeah. only the United States. Yeah. And so you, if if I'm Lenin, uh, <laughs> nobody take that out of context. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what could if possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, the anarchists on Twitter are gonna uh, crucify me, but no. Uh, like if I'm Lenin and I'm looking at Western Europe and I'm, I'm seeing what's going on at the time period, and I'm looking at recent events and I'm looking at what I know at that point. Um, of course, again, you know, I, I have 2020 hindsight, but mm -hmm. I think the thing is, is that. I mean, Germany was, that was the prize. I mean, being able to take Germany potentially could have opened up, and I'm trying not to what if here too much, but it, there was a lot of potential if a successful revolution happened in Germany. And so um, Lenin's, you could say, less than diplomatic um, uh, way of speaking here and his characterization of the infantile... Um, the infantile disorder of the ultra left, like that's when I look at that, like that is it makes a lot of sense. And in the past, I would have probably been like, oh no, like I would have disagreed with it. But looking at it contemporarily, yeah, like that mm -hmm. that analysis makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and like I think that thing you touched on about you know what if Germany had you know if if the if the communists had succeeded in Germany, like. It's likely then that they, you know, that, I mean, because Russia and Germany are, are geographically close together and so on. And, you know, Germany has massive resources at its disposal, despite the um, indemnities and things imposed on it by the Treaty of Versailles. But like, right. Um, but like they would have been so much economically better off Russia uh, was already suffering from several famines before before the Bolsheviks ever came to power. They were already suffering from several massive famine waves that had struck over the last couple of decades, um, and the conditions of the civil war, like the conditions of World War One, made that even worse. And the conditions of the civil war made that even worse on top of it. Yeah. Um, and you know the fourteen imperialist countries dogpiling Russia on top of that. Uh, so, uh, I think that, you know, if Germany, like, you know, we're taking into a little bit of, you know, historical speculation, it's not unreasonable to think that, you know, Russia's condition would have been significantly better and that, you know, uh, the defeat of the communists in Germany, uh, you know, if they had, perhaps if they had won that, uh, you know, that the Soviet Union would never have pursued the policy of socialism in one country, which, you know, arguably was like the move that they just had no choice but to make, given the re incredibly reactionary direction that Europe was going in. But like, you know, I guess that's a that's that's a big, dangerous conversation for another <laughs> time. That's yeah. my that's my uh, somebody's going to quote me out of context saying Comrade Stalin did nothing wrong. But um, that's definitely a conversation for another time. Um, um, anyway, so, uh, I, I um, want to be respectful of your time here. So do you, uh, do you want to, are, are you still wanting to keep going or, um, we can, we can kind of wrap things up if that's what you prefer. Um, 
sure. I'm trying to think. Is there anything else I wanted to touch yeah, on? Yeah, no last words and that kind of thing. And uh, make sure uh, if this is going to be kind of the last thing that you say before uh, signing off here, uh, uh, you know, make sure that folks uh, know where to find you on Twitter and uh, YouTube and all that. So, uh, gotcha. yeah. Um. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll end it there because I'll probably yeah. ramble about yeah. some. Ra- <laughs> um, yeah, so tell folks where they can find you. Um. Okay, so you can find me on uh, well, and Twitter. I don't know why you want to follow me on Twitter, but <laughs> <laughs> no. Um. But uh, yeah, you can follow me uh at the bird side at uh, Alk Historiker. And then if you want to follow me on YouTube, which you should, because I <clears throat> got a video coming out tomorrow. Oh, I promise. Yeah. I promise. I said I said I said I was gonna do it today. And then I was like, uh mm, oops. Uh but yeah, <laughs> it will definitely come out tomorrow. I have to do the uh the ca- the captions. But um yeah, uh you can follow me at Alki. Um and uh yeah, look out for that video tomorrow. It'll probably be on sometime around midday Eastern time. Right on. And uh, so I'm uh, going to put up my card again. Uh, if you enjoyed, uh, thank you everyone who, who came and watched today. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Um, I hope you got something out of it. I dropped a link to uh, the book in the chat earlier. I'm going to go ahead and try to drop it again. Oops, nope, don't have that. Don't have that link ready, so I'm probably just going to skip it. But if you need the book, uh, find me on Twitter. My handle is up there on the screen, at a world to win one. Send me a DM, and I will send you a link to the PDF. And uh, if you like my show, if you like our content, and you really want to see uh, more of this kind of leftist education going on, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash a world to win. And, um, you know, tell your friends and comrades, like if you don't have um, money to contribute, that's fine. I understand the uh, times are tight. Right. So, uh, you know, you can really help our channel by uh, my channel rather by uh, just sharing and discussing this stuff with your comrades. I get personally, I get a lot more mileage out of when I know folks are going out into the world and sharing what they learn and teaching others. So that's, I guess, what I really hope that folks are taking away from this. Um, It's not about me. It's about the movement. It's about all of us. And I really hope that uh, folks uh, can learn and teach others as well from uh, watching what we do here. So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream for today. Um, Make sure to catch me afterwards on Twitter and uh, other platforms.